Uh, Ronak was a PhD in Asia at the IFR, but uh, sadly, he got shot. And uh, then he went on to Stanford for his first postdoc, and then he started to get the information. So, Ronak is going to tell us about exploration of gravitational Okay. All right, everyone. Uh, thanks for the opportunity to speak. Uh, I have a for the next contribution. Uh, yeah, so I'm going to talk about what I want to talk about very broadly my whole trajectory of work. So I thought I would start with a kind of classification of my papers to clarify where I am in the world. So broadly speaking, I work with quantum gravity and quantum information with some intersection with Tendus matter as well. So I split my existing papers into six categories and a seventh category for non-existent papers, uh, also known as in preparation. Uh, and as you can see, three categories are purely quantum gravity, four of them have some intersection with quantum information, and a couple of them have some Intersection with Tendus matter as well. Uh, the ones in the boxes are the ones I will touch on today in this talk. Uh, yeah, so it's going to cover a large section of my work. Obviously, it cannot cover all of it, so sorry about that. Yeah, sorry, I thought the I thought the this thing would be very much bigger. Okay. So first one is entanglement in gauge series, which is what I worked on here with Sandeep. And then there's some black hole physics and scrambling, which is also with Sandeep. Then I did some work on asymptotic symmetries in flat space uh, with some people in perimeter. And then Stanford, I spent a lot of time working on these things for TT bar deformed theories. Uh, and then this entanglement and geometry, which I will talk about today. And then this horizon microstates, which is another category I will talk about today. And the last one is tensor networks in low dimensional gravity, which, uh, which I will talk about at the very end of the talk, if I get time. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. Ronald, as you know, our talks usually have no time limit, but since there are other members, let's try to stick to more. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the, the sort of unperturbed uh, time for this talk is one hour. So, okay. Let's see yeah, what happens after perturbations. <laughs> okay. Let's begin in some, with some ingredients. <laughs> yeah. The perturbations might be small because of the. Most total perturbations should be one hour. Yeah. Usually, here the unperturbed thing is the perturbations. <laughs> okay. Uh, jokes apart. So let's begin with some ingredients. Okay. Uh, the first is the zeroth ingredient in the stock is natural units. So for me and for my entire field, Planck's constant, speed of light, and Boltzmann constant are all one. Uh, so if any, uh, so for people who are not precisely from my field, if any equations don't make dimensional sense, there's a 10% chance I, I wrote the wrong thing, and a 90% chance uh, I, I, these things are coming into play. Uh, with these uh, assignments, uh, there are there's only one dimension in the world, which is mass. Mass is inverse length and length is time. Um, good. So now let's get into the real physics. The first ingredient is gravity. Okay. So the modern is it too small? Think so. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, so the modern theory of uh, gravity is general relativity. Um, Vijay, can you see the slides? Okay. Yes, yes, all good. Okay, good. Yeah. So the bottom theory is general relativity, as all of you know. And general relativity, general relativity is a theory where space time itself deforms in the presence of matter. So you should a good picture for this is a rubber sheet picture, where you have this rubber sheet with a space to space, and then you put a planet on it and then it deforms. And the straight lines on the deformed rubber sheet look like third third lines of the original undeformed rubber sheet. Okay? And everything travels on straight lines unless there is a force acting on it, of course. Uh, more mathematically, the basic variable in this theory is the metric. So you define ds squared, which is the square of the distance between nearby points. So, a nearby point, uh, one point would be, say, it has some time x1, x2, x3, uh, okay? And the nearby point would be the same ones, but time plus dt, x1 plus dx1, and so on. And then the square of the distance is some matrix multiplying dx mu dx mu, where mu goes from 0 to 3. Okay? And the matrix is called the metric. So the equation of motion in this theory is capital G mu nu. The capital G mu nu is the Einstein tensor. It measures curvatures. Okay? P equals 8 by G newton. So G newton is Newton's constant. 
uh, it is 10 to the minus 11 in SI units, so pretty small. Times, uh, and it is the main coupling constraint of gravity, as all of you know. T mu nu, which is the stress energy tensor of matter. So, stress energy tensor is a, it's just a two index object, it's a matrix, and various components of the matrix are stuff like energy density, momentum density, pressure, and so on. Okay? Minus a capital lambda, which is a constant. So, capital, uh, this is called like a cosmological constant. It is positive in our world. In this talk, for most of the stuff, it will be negative. Okay, so I will be talking about uh, situations which are quite far from our world, but hopefully, they teach us something interesting anyway. And the cosmological constant has to multiply a matrix, and the natural matrix can multiply the matrix. So, these are the Einstein's equations. Curvature equals uh, coupling constant times matter minus some background constant. Okay? <coughs> so, a solution of particular interest to this theory is what's called the black hole. So, in terms of the rubber sheet, uh, if you put the sun, the rubber sheet deforms a little bit. But if you put something much more uh, dense, like a neutron star, it deforms a lot more. A black hole is the limit when, and you get this throat region. The black hole is the limit when the throat region in these coordinates becomes infinitely low. Okay? So, from way down here, you can never send light signals into the faraway region which looks flat. Okay? And this is a picture of a black hole. Uh, the black hole itself is the, uh, from the event horizon telescope, the black hole itself is the black dot in the middle, and all of this stuff is stuff that's rotating around the black hole and emitting a lot of light. Okay? The second ingredient is relativistic quantum field theory. The quantum field theory is just a quantum mechanical system. Okay? Except it has a degree of freedom at every point of space. So here is a nice little gif that I found online. He, each of these balls uh, is vibrating uncontrollably, uh, and uh, you know each of these the position of each of these balls is a degree of freedom. Okay, so there's one degree of freedom for all every point in space. In quantum mechanics, usual quantum mechanics that you learn in your theorem of class, the basic variable is the position x of a particle. So in this talk. Uh, x can be a three-dimensional or four-dimensional variable, I'll, I'll drop the vector for simplicity. Okay? So, basic variable is the position x, and states are functions of this basic variable x, psi of x. In QFT, the basic variable is a field, phi of x. Phi of x basically measures the displacement of each uh, of the ball at x. Okay? And the state is a function of this function. Okay? Of, it's called a wave functional. Uh, because we as physicists like to, like to different, differentiate between functions of numbers and functions of functions. Though there is no a priori reason to. So here you actually have three, three coordinates. Yeah, so. Finding space and time, you have yeah, a vector, yeah. right? Uh, yeah. So you're, yeah, yeah. In, in, in this model, it would be a vector. But then, like, it need not it need not be actually vibrating in real space. It could be vibrating in internal space. So, you know. Yeah. Uh, good. The. So the main ingredient of TFT, the reason we don't just call it quantum mechanics with lots of degrees of freedom, is that the operators are local. Okay? The operators measure the position of the ball at x, pi hat of x. Pi hat of x would measure the speed of that ball at x, the momentum of okay? uh, So, in some sense, there's a new structure to the theory, which is locality. But even this is like not that different. The thing that really makes it completely different from QM as we know it is relativity. Okay? Relativity is, as you know, is a statement that no signal can uh, propagate faster than light. Okay? And then you put it in the structure of the theory. If you have two points, x1, t1 and x2, t2, uh, and suppose no signal can go between these two points, then the local operator at these two points must commute. Because a non-zero commutator means a non-zero signal. Okay, and it turns out that this step is incredibly deep uh, and uh, does a lot of funny stuff. Uh, yeah. Now, there is a natural metric here. The me metric is the mean, mean distance between two nearby balls. Okay, that would be a root of ds, square root of ds. Okay, of course, the actual distance is fluctuating, but you set phi of x equals 0, and then what the distance is, is the, the, is the metric. 
the difference between this slide and the previous slide is that in the previous slide the matrix was the metric was a dynamical variable here it is just something you put into the theory okay uh, it's not something that fluctuates so that's the difference between here that that is even the qfk has a metric it is not a gravitational theory because the metric is fixed and of course the qfk has the special operator which is the stress energy tensor operator uh, it's a quantum version of the classical stress energy tensor uh, in particular the t hat not not is the hamiltonian density of the theory of the theory uh, it's not the hamiltonian it's the hamiltonian density sorry for the typo okay so this is the basic introduction to relativity the third ingredient is really a, a mashup of the previous two ingredients. It is called semi classical gravity. What happens is that Newton's constant is a small coupling constant. So it is a sensible effective theory uh, to treat QFT quantum mechanically, but the metric classically. This can never be a fundamental theory. You cannot, you cannot fundamentally couple a classical theory to a quantum theory. There are all sorts of funny stuff that happens. Happen if you try to do that. But it's okay, basically because the coupling bullshit is small. So uh, fluctuations in gravity are suppressed compared to fluctuations in the magnetic. Okay, and it's fine when energies are small and quantum fluctuations are small in your in your case. So what would one funny thing be that happens if you try to couple gas uh, gravity into quantum matter? Uh, there's a standard uh, argument of Feynman, right? That you can violate the uncertainty principle because basically the Actual path gets encoded in the classical field. Yeah, Thank you. yeah. You brought me this argument. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yes, anyway, uh, so funny thing about that argument, I actually looked it up later, and it's not published anywhere. It's written from conference proceedings. It's literally written as like a as a screenplay. So like people are talking. It's funny or something. Funny or something. Yeah. Anyway, uh, so the theory, so this semi-classical gravity, uh, its equation looks very much like Einstein's equations. Just capital G mu equals eight pi g mu t mu nu minus lambda g mu nu, with the one difference that t mu nu is now an expectation value of a quantum operator. And the expectation value itself depends on the matrix. Okay, and it depends on the metric in a very complicated and nonlinear way. So this is an extremely nonlinear equation. It only works because we treat G Newton as one. Okay. Uh, now the, the amazing thing about this equation is that even though it uh, it, it, yeah, it even though it's semi-classical, you treat gravity classically, right? Uh, this equation, this theory has some deeply quantum gravitational knowledge. It knows about some deep quantum gravity stuff. And this talk is really about those quantum gravitational aspects of semi-classical gravity. The fourth ingredient is horizons. Okay, what are horizons? Horizons are surfaces which bound the region of spacetime accessible to an observer. The standard standard type of horizon is the black hole horizon. So here is a diagram by Roger Penrose of a, mat, a piece of matter falling in, collapsing, and becoming a singularity, uh, and which is a black hole. Uh, and then he drew where light rays can go from various points. So from here it can send it off to infinity, or it can send it to singularity. But from deep inside, all light rays go to singularity, nothing goes outside. And this is separatrix between these two regions, and separatrix is known as the event horizon. It is the bound of the it is the boundary of the region accessible to an observer far away here. Okay. Uh, good. So this is a diagram of a collapsing black hole by Roger Penrose. This is a Penrose diagram by someone else. Okay, what is a Penrose diagram? A Penrose diagram is one where we draw light rays as traveling on 45 degrees. Okay, uh, and also we draw it as a two-dimensional diagram. So, for example, we live in four dimensions. Now, how do you represent a four-dimensional spacetime on two dimensions? The way you do it is that you say every point here is a sphere. Okay, so that's two plus two dimensions four, because the sphere has two dimensions. And the radius of the sphere might change on the diagram. So for example, in this picture, the radius of the sphere becomes zero here, infinity here. And notice that it becomes zero, it becomes infinity on a 
uh, on a light like surface. It's a 45 degree surface. And time goes up. So you can see that this, this is the collapsing matter, the black region. And then any uh, light ray from here gets the singularity, any light ray, the right, light ray from here can go in or go out. And the horizon is a separation region between the two. Here is a different type of black hole called an eternal two sided black hole. Okay? This black hole was formed from collapse, so it's a very time dependent thing. So, suppose you try to say, okay, then let's try to make the metric outside time independent. Turns out that something funny happens when you try that. So, here uh, time goes along this arrow here. Uh, sorry, uh, this arrow here. Okay? And uh, this again is a singularity, but because you impose time to, to time transition invariance, you end up with a singularity in the past as well. You get time reversal invariance for free. Okay? And when you get that, you get a you get the second region out here. So this here is one exterior, this here is our second exterior, and you can think of these as two black holes connected by a whirlpool. The other difference from that between these two diagrams. Is that here r equals infinity lives on a straight line going upwards, which is a time like region, which is a time like sort of path. A time like path is the sort of path we take. You know, we don't travel as fast as light. So, uh, of course, we, we can't live here because it's an infinite, uh, infinitely big region, uh, but uh, anyway, it's kind of like us. And so, this is called a two sided asymptotically area black hole, and it will come out again. Uh, yeah. Then there are cosmological horizons. Cosmological horizons bound regions accessible to an observer in digital space, which is like the real world. So here is like a Milky Way. It can see this part, which is called the Hubble radius, and it can't see stuff out here. Okay. Uh, the petrol diagram for this picture is there. Huh? Here, it looks very remarkably similar to this one, but notice that R equals infinity now is here, and R equals zero is here. And then the Milky Way, the boundary of the Milky Way would have a fixed radius, which would traverse this path. And this is the uh, this guy here is the cosmological horizon, and then it can access this field. The third type of horizon is a realer horizon. Okay, it bounds the region accessible to an accelerating observer in flat space. Okay, so here you have an accelerating observer. Uh, you can see that a signal from here will never reach the accelerating observer because the accelerating observer uh, will become uh, goes like this. Similarly, a signal from the accelerating observer will never reach the region. So this this guy here is called the render for it. Okay, good. So these are the ingredients. So now let me get to introduce the main the, the hero of our story, gravitational entropy. So first, tell, let me tell you something about QFT. In QFT, horizons radiate. Okay, so let, let's take the example of a, to see why. Let's take the example of a radial horizon. So here you have position and time going up, okay? And uh, the Hamiltonian is the generator of transitions in time. It moves you up straight, okay? But the accelerating observer is not going up straight, it's going up like this, okay? So the operator, that, the quantum operator that generates this translation is the boost. It really boosts this black space to this green space, okay? The boost operator is often called K. And the point is the Hamiltonian and the boost have very different operators. And to see why, look here. Yeah. Something happened, I'm sorry. Yeah, look here. You see that the boost moves backwards in time on the left. If it moves forward in time, then it moves backward in time. Okay, so it's really going, it's, for half of space time, it's actually going the wrong way, quote unquote wrong way. What this implies after some, uh, you know, you think about it for a while, is that the lowest energy state of H, the, which, which we can call the vacuum, is not the lowest energy eigenvector of K. Okay? It is some general excited state with respect to K. In particular, if the global state of the QFK is omega, is the vacuum, this accelerated observer sees a thermal path of particles, and this is known as the Unruh effect. Most formally, we can talk about this by talking about the reduced state for this observer. The reduced state lives in this right wedge here because the observer has no access to the left wedge. Right? So we can, it's some density matrix living on the right side. 
And what is the density matrix? It's e to the minus beta k. But k is a, an operator that only, only does a boost on the right side. It gives the left side anywhere. Okay, this is a bad operator. We don't usually consider it, but uh, let's consider it for it. And the beta has a specific value, just two pi. Uh, okay. Uh, this proper time here has no dimension, so that's why beta is also dimension. Okay. Here is a operator. It is not. It's not in a well defined operator. Yeah. So this is in, this is like a taking us true with approximations. Okay. So it's, so the point is it looks thermal with respect to this boost generator on the right side. Okay. And of course, so the thermal path is just a, is just a simple way of saying the reduced density matrix is thermal. Is the thermal density matrix. Okay? And it turns out that an, an observer outside the horizon seeing the such thing such a thermal path is generic whenever you have a horizon. Okay? So, uh, I'm a bit confused. You said it's not a good operator, it doesn't have a bounded spectrum. What does it mean? And I could see some e to the power minus yeah. something. Yeah. What does it mean to be normally when I so it's a, it's Think of e to minus beta h with something which is bounded from below. Right? Yeah, so it's bound. It is bounded from below. It's, it's a positive operator, but it's not. Its fluctuations are finite, infinite. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, the precise way to say it is that this makes sense as a quadratic form, not as an operator. Mm -hmm. So basically, you can carry, carry use it to calculate correlation yeah. functions. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but yeah, like in the, at the level of this talk, let's just call it an operator. Yeah. Uh, the part that the only the main part that depends on the uh, actual horizon is the fact that is the value of the inverse temperature beta, and also the specific thing that uh, takes the place of KR will depend on the space time. But roughly speaking, very close to the horizon, it will always look like a push. Okay, so just in QFT, the statement for QFT, there's no gravity here. All horizons have a temperature, and relativity was very important. When non relativistic QFT, there is no boost of it. Okay, even the two sided boost of it. So, yeah. <coughs> anyway. Uh, good. Now, you take this fact that horizons of a temperature at gravity and you get something radical. Okay? Because when you have gravity, you start noticing that horizons have a mass. Okay, so you have a black hole, you throw some stuff in, the mass of the black hole is what you throw in, the mass of what you throw in. You add, you throw more stuff in, the mass increases. The black hole radiates, it evaporates, it becomes smaller, the mass decreases. So change, mass can change in gravity. This is not something that's true in QFT. Okay? Uh, the temperature, there is a temperature in QFT, there is a change in mass and gravity. Whenever you have these two things, you have a change in entropy by the second law of thermodynamics. So semi classical gravity assigns an entropy to horizons. It turns out that when uh, that uh, quite generally, this entropy, this area of the horizon over 14, okay, leading order. And remember, G Newton is small, so 1 over G Newton is huge. So this is this is a very big leading order term. So there, there will be corrections. In the case of black hole, this entropy is known as the Bekenstein Hawking entropy. In the case of cosmological horizon, it's known as the Siemens Hawking entropy. In the case of regular horizons, it's not interesting enough to have a name. Uh, I just call it gravitational entropy. Uh, oh, actually, I guess this name was coined by Lukoich and Mardas. Uh, anyway, so some, some important questions for me are does this entropy have a straight complete interpretation? This is a thermodynamic derivation. Thermodynamics logic, uh, uh, chronologically always preceded statistical mechanics, which where entropy is given first state counting entropies. Yeah. And if it does have a state counting interpretation, what are these means? Okay. So okay, here's what I want to tell you about. So our, our key was gravitational entropy. The first thing I'll talk about is entanglement and space time. And I, here are some slogans. I'll get space time from entanglement, and then I will rearrange space time with entanglement. Okay. Uh, this is basically these slogans are basically nonsense, but they sound good. Uh, then I'll talk that my, I'll have exactly one side about ex exact microstates, and then I talk about effective microstates for the for the entropy. So, and this is just my uh, yeah. lack of knowledge. I remember uh, somebody, you know, Gautam and Penta had all 
calculated entropy of black holes using microstate. Yeah. So well, how is this different from that or conceptually or in any other way? Yeah, very yeah. important question and it's uh, going to be here. Okay, oh, fine. So, yeah. So before I get there, I need to introduce one more thing, which is holography and the ADS CFT duality. So uh, remember that a quantum field theory has a degree of freedom at every point of space. Because of this, the maximum entropy can fit into a region, say this ball I'm drawing with my hands, scales with the volume, because you can put a, a bit of information into each of these little balls. But in gravity, if you try to fill up the ball with an entropy more than A over 4G Newton, it collapses into a black hole. Okay. Uh, the argument I gave is well, well and good for in certain cases, but uh, better arguments you can read in this review by Rafael Busso called the holographic model. Okay. But uh, in some sense, entropy is bounded by over fifty. So this fact led to the formulation of the holographic principle. It basically says, look, if everything about the state inside is encoded on the out, on the boundary. In some sense, the state is already is actually on the boundary. Everything is happening on the boundary. You know, uh, if the state changes, you can see it on the boundary. If you measure something, you can try to measure it on the boundary, etc. So this is the holographic principle. All degrees of freedom in a gravitational theory live on the boundary. If you take extremely carefully, uh, to the resolution you need for this, by the way, scales like e to the minus entropy, uh, which is e to the minus one over g newton. It is e to the 10 to the e to the minus 10 to the 11 in your SI units. So you can imagine that it's extremely careful that you need. But yeah, uh, here's a picture for that. Here's a apple falling on Newton. Newton not picture for some reason. Uh, and uh, it's all happening in three dimensions. But you can actually read off what's actually happening from the two dimensional boundary on the box. Yeah. Now, we do not know this principle is approximately true in general. Okay, about gravity in the real world. But we know some examples where it is a precise case. It is exactly true. These examples go by the name of the ADS CFT duality. So I need to introduce ADS and CFT. ADS is anti dissider. So anti dissider space is a funny type of space time. So space is less. A constant time flip looks of three dimensional anti dissider looks like this. <clears throat> Sorry, Ronak uh, Vijay here. Yeah, hi. Uh, in, in the previous thing, I mean, I've heard this holographic principle many times, but never really fully understood. What is this surface you're talking about? I mean, is this some hypothetical higher dimensional space you're introducing here or? So the, the, bulk, the bulk is the real world and surface would be some boundary, so surface bounding like uh, say the Milky Way or something like that. Okay. Uh, just as an example. Now, the point is, uh, we don't know the details of where you can put the surface and where you can't because we don't have a UV complete, uh, we don't have a UV complete theory of gravity which we can prove in that way. But this this is, what I you're still talking about a 2D surface in the standard three dimensional world only. Yeah. Uh, in principle, this 2D surface could be all the way out at infinity. It might not even be accessible to us from inside. It might be infinitely far away. Uh, yeah. Or it might be, yeah. So the point is, we don't. Uh, know that maybe it's possible to put it at finite distance also, also but we don't know about this because we haven't, uh, we, we don't know gravity as well enough to say where we can put the surface and where we can't, which is what I meant by saying we don't even know if it's approximately true in general, uh, in general. Okay, but basically there's some mathematical equivalence between these two pictures and... Oh. Yeah, and in ADS CFT it's an exact, it's a mathematical sort of equivalence, but in general, it is hoped that this is more generally true, even in a real world. Though we do not know if it is. Okay, all right, carry on. So, so you made the further statement that you have to look very carefully yeah. as in exponential minus this thing or this to be correct. But yeah, to, to, to actually see this. Normally one says the other way. It looks correct unless it, uh, no, no, in other situations. Not in yeah, so the point is the fact that, uh, so, okay, good. So the question is, can you distinguish two different states? If you have two states that are different in the bulk, say, you have a red apple falling on Newton or a green apple falling on Newton, can you see it from the boundary of the Milky Way? Just by measurement for the boundary of the Milky Way. And you can't wait for the signal to get out. Okay, 
So now this is where resolution comes into picture. In the sense that the fact that inside theory is gravity is crucial for this because in case like inside yes. the boundary condition and tell me exactly. Exactly. This gravity is extremely crucial. Otherwise, it makes no sense. Yeah. Any more questions? No, I think these claims by Sukhara and friends that uh, in perturbation theory you can resolve more and more details. Yeah. So, uh, how does that tie up with these? I, I think uh, my understanding is that that also requires uh, exponential accuracy. But it was perturbation theory, they did a one loop calculation. Yeah, they, they did one loop calculation to show that you get some uh, non trivial. Uh, yeah, but uh, the point is to actually, uh, uh, to basically, if you have a black hole and you want to. Uh, distinguish the states of black hole, I believe you need exponential. Okay. But in the absence of a black hole? Uh, in the absence of a black hole, that's a good question and uh, I think the it being at exact stripeless might be important there. Just but ADS though, suppose something's in the center of ADS and from the boundary. Yeah, the then, then I'm not sure. Okay. Yeah. yeah. At least in flat space, if you, go, if you put it at finite distance, this is a paper by Busso and Wall and others which shows that we need infinite time. Yeah. Yeah, but ADS, I should think about it. Cool. Uh, so let me introduce anti set of space. So this is a constant time slice of anti set of space. All of these backs are equal area and there are infinite backs. So it's an infinitely big thing. The volume is infinite. So that's fine. Like you, you are used to infinitely big things. We have a universe around us after all. Right? The funny thing about anti set of space is that if you stand in the center, and you throw a light ray out, so this is a light ray, it goes out and it comes back in, in finite time. Okay? This is exotic. We are not used to throwing stuff out at infinity and then 10 generations later receiving the signal. This is not something we expect to find in our way. Okay? Uh, so this fact is mathematically, uh, the mathematical statement is that ADS has a time like conformal boundary. And this, the fact that this is exotic is just the fact that uh, the cosmological constant in this case is less than zero, whereas is positive in our world. Okay? More generally, we don't really just want to look at ADS. We want to look at things that look like ADS from far away. Okay? So here is an example of a black hole that collapses, becomes a, a matter of cell that collapses, becomes a black hole evaporates. It's not ADS. ADS is going to fly here from the case. Huh? You can use zero for a conformal. This is a conformal theory. No, no, the, the boundary is uh, there's a conformal boundary, but the theory itself is not conformal in the sense of being invariant under conformal transformations. In fact, uh, the next slide will be about conformal transformations. So, I was wondering whether you can use the ADS here. Yeah. I'm sorry, I'm not understanding the question. So, the, the theory is not conformal. The space has a conformal boundary. Like, uh, yeah. The boundary of this is conformal to a cylinder. Okay. And maybe Shabra will talk about the boundary theory. Yeah, yeah. That, that I'll get to. Yeah, the boundary theory has a conformal symmetry. And, yeah. So, which I just wanted to emphasize that you can have all sorts of stuff happening in the bulk of ADS, but very far away it looks, looks exactly like this. Okay. So, if all the backs in the middle can be deformed, but all the bats near the boundary are not. These are called asymptotically ADS space times. Okay? Good. So, now getting to the question. The second uh, aspect of the ADS safety duality is the CFT, the conformal field theory. The conformal field theory is just a quantum field theory, a relativistic quantum field theory, with a special symmetry where you can rescale the metric by a local function. An example of such a thing is a stereographic projection from the sphere to the uh, plane. Okay? Uh, yeah. These are very interesting theory. The most interesting critical points are described by CFDs. Also, you can study them using in strong coupling by a variety of methods, which are not always available for general theories. And the ADS safety duality is a quantum gravity on a d plus one dimensional asymptotically ADS space is dual, which by which I mean equivalent to the theory to a d-dimensional non-gravitational CFT living on its conformal boundary. Mm -hmm. Okay. In particular, there is a one-to-one -one map between CFT states and gravitational states. Yeah. So this is really a conjecture, but it's it's an extremely well tested conjecture. So this quantum gravity you're talking about is in the semi-classical version? 
No, so the, the proper when the metric itself. It's definitely uh, checked very well at semi-classical level, but it is believed to be too. It's believed that the CFT is really a definition of true quantum gravity. Uh, but yeah, for now I just want to say this. Uh, for this talk, I'll just use the semi-classical description. Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. The, so the map between states looks like the CFT vacuum is going to this global radius space, which I drew for you. An excited state looks like some different asymptotically radius space time. And the fact that this is time dependent in the bulk is going to the fact that the boundary state has got an energy <laughs> angle, but it works. Okay. So different states in CFT in general correspond to different geometries in the bulk. And that is one really cool thing about ADS CFT. It geometrizes simple things. You know, apart from the natural geometry of this bit. <coughs> in fact, the geometry is something much, 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 much worse. Which is entanglement entropy. So consider a CFT living on this two, two dimensional space at one time, and you split up the CFT into two regions, A and A bar. So a bunch of little balls here, bunch of little balls here. Call these little balls a subsystem of the full system. And then you can ask about the entanglement between the balls here and the balls outside. Okay. And the entanglement entropy is just you calculate the radio density matrix for the subsystem and take rho a log, trace of rho a log rho. Okay. So this is called an entanglement entropy. Uh, oh, slight uh, deformulation of this in the case of a relativistic KFT is the following. So instead of a two, I draw the entire spatial size as a single line, and then A is this region here. And now I can draw a causal diagram. Go from the boundary of A, go up, and then wait till the light rays meet, then simulate for the for the past. And this is the region of space time. And any operator in this causal diagram can be Heisenberg evolved to some operator living on A. Okay. So here your subregion is a causal diagram. Okay. And uh, this is again by relativity, relativisticness of it is you do. So what's important? What was the last thing? I understand it can be possible. So basically this, uh, this, the subsystem is the causal diagram, not the interval itself. Yeah. Let's say that there's no new degrees of freedom inside that diagram. Okay. And now it's an extremely nonlinear thing, right? That's what rho a log rho a. Rho a depends on the state, you're taking its log. So one way of saying what you just said is that we draw another slice that has the same boundaries. Yeah. But so and it's everywhere space like it will have the same entanglement. Yes, it is the same subset. Yes, thank you. Good. Now in ADS CFT, there's an extremely non-linear thing which is hard to calculate. So, uh, Ronald, yeah. uh, suppose it was not relativistic, mm -hmm. but uh, let's say some Lipschitz or some such yeah. weird thing. Yeah. Then instead of this uh, diamond, maybe you'll have some squashed, some, uh, something like that. Presumably, uh, I've not really studied uh, what, how this particular thing changes with the scale. Uh, but yeah. It may not be just only the property of uh, there is what a field theory that you know we yeah. you can um, sort of uh, that's uh, a fair point. Yeah, uh, yeah. I would have to. I just went at a completely non-relativistic say some condensed matter core system, but it has other property. Okay. It has it does have this uh, uh, Lee Robinson velocity, but that's not good enough. Uh, okay. Uh, good. In ADS CFT, this extremely nonlinear thing is easy to compute. Okay, so if you have a region A on the boundary of uh, on the boundary of the space, so A is the side plate here. To calculate entanglement, what I do is I look for the minimal extremal surface whose boundary agrees with it, or agrees with the boundary of it, which ends on these two points. Okay, and then I look at the for the minimal extremal surface, I look at area of the that is the entanglement of A. Okay, this is called the Ryu Takanagi formula. It is uh, to date, I think, one of the deepest things, uh, an, an extremely deep thing that we know. And uh, this region, this minimal extremal surface is called the RT surface. And Ryu Takanagi was told only in ADS CFT, like it's a user's ADS CFT. It is only told with ADS CFT, it's not some statement about it. Yeah. Good. 
the, 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 another amazing thing about Dati Shabdash, that generically, but also you, there are real things in the like formulas and semi-classical gravity. Yeah. You have a semi-classical gravity. Yeah, but it might not be something well defined on the boundary. Yeah. 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 So to make it well defined on the boundary, you need it to be a CRT. Yeah. yeah. Of course, the Ryutakari formula itself is a semi-classical formula. It is not, there is no, there is no true quantum version. Yeah. No, what I was saying was that these arguments by Maldasena and friends, yeah. or islands, yeah. apply a Ryutakari like ideas to asymptotically flat, flat gravity. Yeah. You hope that at least approximately they can. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. It feels like they might have more validity than just it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, for example, there's this uh, there's this quantity called effective entropy, which yeah. But I agree. Yeah, I wanted to focus so on the yeah. yeah. Cool. The amazing thing about about this formula is that RT surfaces generally cannot send signals to DA or receive signals from. So, for example, here this brown region is the region that. Uh, uh, D A can this boundary D of A can interact with D of A is this further diamond up here. Uh, this region is in the bar, and almost always the R T surface is outside. In the other cases, exactly on the boundary. So this formula is something much more than causal. It's kind of almost a causal. Like there's something beyond causality here. And this goes back to the thing that the question of Shomina, like. If you want to figure out whether the uh, collaboratory principle says that you can figure out whether the apple is red or green without waiting for a signal to come out. So here you see a, a simple example. So you can know the entropy of the, the area of the surface from a space from a space like this region. Cool. And the black hole entropy is an example of the RT formula. Okay. Uh, so you take a special state of two CFTs, which looks like uh, taking two energy eigenstates, uh, sorry, L and R are two CFTs, these are energy eigenstates, and you take this uh, uh, superposition with this square root of Gibbs star of weight, okay, beta over two instead of beta, and then you have two CFTs on the, and then the bulk dual is the two-sided asymptotic linear that I introduced earlier, and if you want to calculate the entropy of one of the CFTs with the other, the RT surface is the, is the horizon. If this is a spatial slice or this is a spatial slice, it becomes infinitely big on the two ends, and then it has a throat. And the area of that throat is the area of the horizon, which is the Eckstein Hockey Okay. And the fact that the, this has these two boundaries are connected uh, is also known as the, the statement that the bulk has a world goal or an Einstein Rosen bridge. Okay. What's interesting about this is that if you forget about the sum, you just take one pair of states E L E R. There is no such one more. So one more comes because of some knows so many things. It is a direct dual, direct bulk dual of entanglement. Okay, this fact that wormholes come with because of uh, entanglement is uh, well, it's a, a particular example of what's known as ER ER equals EPR. Okay. So the black hole entropy, entropy in this case is the amount of entanglement between two CFTs. So now we know the microstates. Then whatever CFT states participate in the entanglement. The technical diminishment eigenstates. Okay. So, so, however, we found the microstates, but they're in like a very different description. There's no gravity here. The CFT does not have an explicit metric in the bulk. You know? So, one question there. So, calculate the entanglement on the CFT of the subsystem whose endpoints are then connected yeah. in the bulk. So, the so, here the subsystem has no endpoints, so the RT circuit also has no endpoints. Yeah, yeah, that's a, that's a good, good subtlety, and I was rushing into that. Okay. Yeah. Very good. Uh, so, this is it. So, now let me talk about how much time do I have left? I don't know when did we start? 20 minutes. 20 minutes? 10 past 5. Minutes. Okay, good. Tell me when the time. Uh, okay, good. So, the fact that the hormones appears only in certain states is an indicator of the general structure of quantum error correction. So what is quantum error correction? It's basically you want to have a message and you want to send someone else and you have a wire and that transmitting through that wire might be a bit noisy, it might scramble your message you send it. So classically what you would do is you just for example send it hundreds of times and then you think that probabilistically only different bits of the message get scrambled so it can be recursive. Uh, there are better algorithms and better algorithms have been known since uh, for around 3000 years. 
Because the reason the Vedas were never written down was that they are memorized in an error corrected form. Okay. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, unfortunately, the quantum version of this is a bit more new. Little bit new. Okay. Yeah. Uh, okay. Good. So, the quantum version of this you cannot just repeat the message because in quantum mechanics there's the no clock cloning theorem. It says you can't just take a state and make two copies. So it's a little little more involved. Okay. What do you do? You should take a big Hilbert space, which I mentioned is a small Hilbert space, you take a big Hilbert space and put the small Hilbert space in a, as a very special small Hilbert space inside the big Hilbert space. Or some generic small Hilbert space, some, something special. The small Hilbert space needs to have some good properties. In another example, the small Hilbert space is a Hilbert space of perturbative matter excitation around the two sided black hole. And the special property is the fact that there is a work. Okay? In fact, it's quite true that very true that very generally in quantum error correction, the special property is very often entanglement, a large amount of entanglement. Okay. Between the small subsystem and the bigger. Like yeah, the small subsystem has is a very highly entangled subsystem between subsystems. Yeah. Yeah. Subsystems of the small subsystem are highly entangled. <laughs> <laughs> so that's the most. But yeah, and here again we have a high entanglement. Our entanglement scales with 1 over G, which is great. Uh, good. And this similar story is true for other RT surfaces as well. So here's an RT surface for a region on the boundary A. Okay, you have some matter excitations EA, so matter excitation on the side EA bar. And the fun part is that all of the information about these matter excitations is actually encoded in A. This is something logically different from what I told you till now. But it's Something you can prove. Uh, prove by some combination of these people down here. Uh, actually, I, I didn't. It was proved by a slightly different set of people. Sorry about that. You should have cited. Uh, good. Now, so you have, a, you have an error corrected subspace which has two. The error corrected subspace, the code subspace, has two subsystems itself. And each of the subsystems is encoded in different subsystems of the larger Hilbert space. It turns out that any such code has a very general structure, and the structure is drawn here. You take your encoded Hilbert space, the two sides, you add a huge amount of entanglement, which is a sky state, and you put some unitary on each side, and uh, that unitary maps this stuff into, into your actual larger Hilbert space. This is, at the same time, a very strong statement and a very weak statement. A very strong statement because it is telling you about the factorization of a, of a large class of states. It's very weak because it does not tell you what, what Hilbert space is here, what military is here, what chi is here, what A is there. Okay, it's just telling you that such a factorization exists. It doesn't tell you what that factorization is. Okay. Hello. So you said it's strong because UA and UA bar are acting on different spaces? Yeah, exactly. It's like, oh, uh, yeah. Sorry, uh, if I understand the statement is if error correction should is possible, then this is the statement. Uh, the, I mean, it's, it's, a, coding, it's a series of if and only ifs, right? So if uh, if the JNMS is true and complementary recovery and this factorization are if and only if delayed. Yeah, given JNMS etc. Yeah. which you already yeah. used, then in addition if you have error correction. No, if, then, if JNMS is true, that immediately implies uh, Integral by reconstruction, which immediately implies this. Like, the, the, there's no nothing you need to add to JLMF to get this. <laughs> and this is a this is a standalone statement in error correction in a sense that if I wanted to do error correction, mm -hmm. then the inputting would have to be of this. Yeah, if you wanted to do error correction with this property, <laughs> and this, yeah, but the point is this this property. Immediately apply this, at least when for type 1 algebra or whatever. Yeah. And roughly, yeah. what is chi? Roughly. Chi, so here's the thing, right? It's not a e -E 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 bar system. Yeah, this is the point. It's, uh, this UA and UA bar, generally in ADS CFT, are incredibly complicated units. They're exponentially complex. Okay, so chi is just you're distilling out the entanglement using this exponentially complex unit. So 
Inside a, a bar, we do not have a single example where we know what it is. And those up arrows are, are inclusions. What up arrow? The, the arrow from U A to A. Is it like? Oh yeah, this is like this is like circuit time. Is that an inclusion? Is it from a map from a smaller space to a bigger space? Uh, yeah. Okay. It's an isometry, not unitary. Just like. The reason I treat it as unitary is that Arlo had a different way of writing it where it was just a lot of extra stuff. Yeah. And, I, and as you can see, I don't make my own pictures. Uh, yeah. Cool. So now let's get to the fun part of the talk, which I will discuss then. So I, so I mentioned that the two sided black hole is dual to a very particular state of the boundary CFT, and that the EF it does not exist in the factorized state. Okay. So this Natural questions are how robust is the wormhole? Is it true for just one state? Is it true for a whole class of states? Uh, how much can I mess with the uh, with the weights to till I break the wormhole? Stuff like this. Another natural another natural question is uh, okay, we have bounded description of the microstates. Is that some bulk description and is it unique? And some sense, both of these questions were uh, uh, partly dealt with in a paper I wrote with Omkar and uh, Louis. So is the first of the two questions you asked is that the same as the question of whether generic states are fire ones? Uh, no. It uh, the generic it, uh, the your question is more specific than this. You can break a wormhole and have some food paste inside it. Okay, but uh, uh, are generic states fire ones? It's a good question. Uh, it is believed that typical states are firewalls. Uh, there is a slightly unconvincing argument by Boswell and Polchinski. I asked around if, for the most convincing argument, and the one I was given was we haven't found a <coughs> description for typical states that has that has moves. <laughs> so anyway, a lot of people believe that typical states are firewalls, which is slightly uh, different to generic. So, but uh, yeah, like is it's like not a quantitative thing. fraction of states. That are smooth geometries are, I mean, like so, yeah. If you believe that typical states are for firewalls, then uh, the measure zero set of eigenstates are smooth. I see. But because if, if yeah. the total number of states is e to the power s, then order one states are smooth. Or only order one. Yeah, like order author one author orthogonal states. I think. Like, so the point is this more precisely: the number of roughly orthogonal states is e to the e to the s, and then order the roughly orthogonal states e to the s would be smooth. But then the point is e to the s is a very small fraction of e to the e to the s. Yeah. Uh, anyway, and really, semi-classical states are not really orthogonal states; they're roughly orthogonal. Just one related. There was this paper by Stanford in which he's, which I only read the introduction, but he claimed that he had a, he wanted to conjecture that roughly half of there was a half probability of getting a firewall and half smooth states after time to the bias. And does this connect with your question? Probably, but uh, I have not read this paper. What is this statement? That if you wait for a very old black hole, uh, you make the black hole make time e to the power s, then uh, uh, then you compute the amplitude of getting a firewall versus a smooth state. There's a lot of conjecture in a very toy, very toy toy model. But uh, it was like one by root two you get a smooth state and one by root two you get a firewall. Yeah. Oh yeah, I remember this. I want to talk about it. The model for a firewall was also a bit. Yeah, uh, yeah that was for evaporation. I think it's like these EDS2 kind of models. So. Yeah. yeah. Close the device. Just wait, you know. Yeah. Because the real world, I mean, the black hole is the black hole, and it's back to school. Yeah. So yeah. collapse, collapse. So like yeah. Okay, you can do something in the ADS. It's like an ADS, like a state. Yeah, it yeah. seems like. Yeah. Even an ADS, right? Collapse black holes would be smooth, but collapse black holes are highly non-uniform. Uh, then they're just very, just not typical. So typical black holes. That's why I distinguish between typical and generic. Generic black holes that you are likely to find, uh, it, is not, it is believed that they don't have firewalls. Typical eigenstates are believed to have firewalls. That's just a count of the typical state having something here. Basically. Yeah. I mean, yeah. yeah. Like the, the Schmidt eigenvector thing need not be this. I agree, uh, but uh, yeah. <coughs> anyway, but. Uh, Sorry, in the context of a Joptwig collapse, mm -hmm. and there's a whole region uh, above the Joptwig criticality mm -hmm. where you know for sure that uh, you know uh, you will form a firewall. Uh -huh. uh, there's no uh, no question of a firewall in those geometries. 
Uh, yeah, and this is, uh, yeah. What's important is that this comes, the same state comes out regardless of the details. Okay. So, what is this? Uh, so, this is a paper I wrote in 2021 with Omkar and uh, Louis Anderson. Uh, so, what does this tell us? So, when there's enough entanglement, you move the term. Uh, yeah. When the entanglement of uh, the M goes above the entanglement of the black hole, you end up here. Yeah. So, try to try to keep the amount of entanglement bounded. And those green lines, what what am I? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Cool. Uh, so, what are the lessons? The first lesson is that matter entanglement can become gravitational entanglement. Uh, you know, we entangle this ETWs. Uh, I found it entangled the ETW, which is a toy model for matter, and found a two sided black hole where the entanglement is the area of the prime. So, EPR goes here. For EPR, I can produce the which is the first example of entanglement. So, sorry, Corona. So, those two things that you showed in the previous, the two different solutions of JT gravity. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the dominant changes. And the, uh, the, the, the shape of the, the distinguished by the shape of the. the yeah, yeah, yeah. And in principle, if the eyes are not exactly degenerate, there could be some little bit of uh, stuff in the world. Yeah. yeah. And then it's completely smooth geometry. It's yeah. Like, that's it. Yeah. Same question. Can you diagnose this end of the world plane in this second solution? Uh, you can by uh, basically looking at uh, mod squared of inner products. Inner product won't change, but mod squared of inner product will. And uh, this is uh, to do with the fact that gravity is kind of a post green description. Well, you know, you know, you, you, yeah, the whole story there. Mm, but anyway, the, we, without going into the advanced things, the point is that EPR can become ER. So you can get space time from entanglement. Uh, the gravitational entanglement removes details of the matter entanglement, meaning that not only is it robust, it's in fact much worse. It's, the appearance of the air bridge is a post gaining phenomenon. Okay. Uh, in terms of the QSC, QSC code, this means that the circuit I showed is approximate and not, not isometric. Okay? It doesn't preserve inner products from the semi classical but to the fundamental disciplines. We can make this work with even with a QFT in the bulk. Uh, yeah. But that's fine. Uh, so the point is that matter entanglement can be converted into gravitational entropy after post gaming. This is the first lesson. Okay. Uh, Statement that it's non isometric simply the fact that it might seem at first sight that you can have many more orthogonal states than that. Yeah, so, yeah, so if the naively orthogonal states highly outnumber the actually orthogonal The basically, like uh, in the fundamental Hilbert space, there are e to the e to the s, roughly speaking, orthogonal states. And the point is semi classically, each of these look orthogonal to us. Okay, even though they're not actually orthogonal. Yeah. Uh, good. So in the case of the island story, it's not a geometrical wormhole going. Yeah, that's exactly why we worked on this. We wanted a geometrical wormhole. So what's the difference? What? Why was there a geometrical wormhole here? So roughly speaking, what you need to do with the island with the in the island story is that you need to uh, cool the entanglement and condense it into fewer degrees of freedom to find the wormhole. Uh, basically, we had a real time model. Where what happened was basically because the entanglement had a lot of phases, uh, you didn't actually get a wormhole. But if you kind of uh, reduce, I don't know why it's. I love that it's. I love that it's cricket commentary. <laughs> <laughs> okay, football. I'm sorry. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Anyway. <laughs> no, it's cool. It's cool. Uh, yeah. So in that case, basically the, the phases made it hard to get a wormhole. But in some sense, you kind of uh, remove the phases by, say, reducing the total energy in the system. You get, you do get the wormhole. Uh, Even though you don't have to put any special properties. On the so in this case, what you what we put is in some sense that it's uh, quote unquote the phases are not there. We basically put it in the Euclidean part. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. So you can add phases to MIJ, but those are stupid, stupid phases. The real phases are the ones that you get from. Uh, real time evolution of uh, eight types of order one by gene. Those phases are hard to deal with. Yeah. Okay, so I'll skip this slide, but it's a slide, it's a paper I wrote in 2020 where we used uh, we used some entanglement properties of the bulk QFT to move space time around. So here you have a signal that 
cannot be seen in D of A, and the signal after you do some entanglement stuff, uh, some uh, call per cycle, so it's called, uh, you actually can see the signal. So it actually rearranges space time using entanglement. It's a nice paper, but it would take too long to extend, so I'll skip it. One thing which actually seems a bit odd now, coming to think about it, they said you don't know where to place the boundary, but now you're saying you can do things on the boundary which will shift the bulk around. And you're saying this doesn't matter where your boundary is at all in this. And no, you in, don't know it at in all. ADSCFT, you do know where to put the boundary? You don't know. Yeah, you, you, you like it's at, it's at the boundary of ADS? Okay. Yeah. Uh, and in this case, we did something in the bulk actually. Yeah, we actually did something with this. Uh, Discontinuous looking green region. Uh, okay. Uh, and uh, yeah. Cool. So now let me comment on exact microstates. I have a one slide on it, which, uh, but yeah. So we have already seen some one example of exact microstates, which is the CFT Schmidt eigenstates. Uh, in general, we don't expect gravity alone to have microstates. So it's uh, very close to gravity. Because in some sense, it behaves more, more like a thermodynamic theory. In fact, one uh, you can actually derive some limits of the Einstein equations using thermodynamic assumptions, so as shown by Jacobson in 1990, the 1990 something. Yeah, I was like four years old at the time. So, <laughs> uh, so you need something new to get a kinetic theory of gases or statistical mechanics. Okay, and this is something that uh, is not a precise statement, but it's been uh, it makes sense from uh, experience. So the new thing might be holography or string theory, for example. But it could be something new as well that we don't know. So, but still, if you do some fun stuff, so in this paper by uh, far too many authors to name, uh, we found a way to take 3D black hole microstates in 3D ADS and map them to microstates of the cosmological horizon in distant space in the same dim same uh, dimension. And we just used uh, these microstates, of course, live in a bulk in the boundary dual, and these live in some putative boundary dual. They still don't live in the gravitational description, but Using semiconductor gravity techniques, we we able we were able to find a map. Okay. Uh, in general, I do believe that black hole microstates, precise ones, should not be would not be visible in the description where there is a horizon. Uh, the experience that goes behind this is that all known examples uh, are uh, are in cases where you have a non-gravitational dual, like the example we've already gone over, or this paper, or this paper of mine from three four months ago. Or in the regime where gravity is UV completed and there is no black hole. The Prominger Rafa, uh, uh, Mandel's uh, Gotham and Spenta, etc., all of these. Uh, Mandel's Wadi? Yes, because what are we? And uh, but, uh, we, we were not involved in the counting. We were involved in yeah, moving, you, moving the radiation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. I, I remember. Yeah, sorry. And yeah, I should have probably looked it up and put, put the right side. Sorry about that. But yeah, uh, so this answers your question from earlier. So. There is no black hole in that situation. Okay, what happens is that you take those solutions and you tune up, you change the coupling portion, and then it collapses into black. But you can actually do counting when there's no black hole. Okay. Actually, if you're talking about references, it's going to be unusual, but it's actually unsure. With a stretched horizon, prior to storming, yeah. showing that the entire charge function is correct. Yes, not acknowledged, but it actually. They really foresaw that all of them. I all right, never mind. Yeah, no, I, Old people will say, yeah, yeah. say but no, it's yeah. true. It's true. It's yeah, not sure. for sure. Yeah, for sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. 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 All right. Yet again, my excuse that is that I was five years old. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. I, but I, I should know the literature better. Okay. Yeah. Uh, good. So this is all I wanted to say about exact microstates. Actually, I haven't understood what you said. Could you just summarize what was your confusion about exact microstates? Uh, I sh do, I don't believe you find them in a description where there is a horizon, and in the regime where in the regime where there is a horizon, I suspect that the exact microstate will be in some completely different description where gravity is not like where gravity is emergent and non trivial. So you are saying that there is not a microstate description that and the horizon in gravity. I, I this is my belief. Uh, my only reason I believe this is that is experience. It's not this is not some uh, theorem. So this is an anti fastball then. Uh, the fastballs don't have horizons. So I thought you were saying that you should never simultane in, in gravity simultaneously have a reliable horizon and many fastballs. Is that what? But fastballs don't have horizons. So 
But like the first, that's fine. So they're saying that the horizon is something you see in so in some experiments. It looks like a horizon in some experiments, but uh, if you probe a little further, the horizon goes away. Sorry, then tell, then I have not understood your confusion. Please say again what you are saying. What what was your? I thought you were saying that you should that you will never simultaneously have e to, a reliable description of e to the power s non-horizon states and the horizon. Yeah, but uh, that's right. And so the point is that if, if for example, the first first ball, what is your summary is exactly right. So in the case of first ball, what they would say is that uh, at high energies, you get these first ball states that don't have a horizon, but you have e to the s of them. But at low energies, uh, for low energy experiments, you can walk up the answer with like just having a horizon. Okay, and that's fine because in the in low energies you cannot uh, resolve the first ball. No, but then you are saying that there are simultaneously in the same theory, same gravitational theory, a reliable description of e to the power s moon states and a horizon. So you are saying that the, the reliable description of these e to the power s states is the correct description of the horizon. Oh, I see your point. Okay, yeah. so, so I, 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 should, I should have made a more more careful statement to account for the possibility of this. I'm not. Uh, uh, what I want to say is just that uh, the, the horizon will go away if you have microstates, and uh, if you can count microstates, like it, you won't see the horizon. Won't see the horizon while you're counting. But there may independently be a solution with the horizon whose entropy is the right count. Yeah, yeah. So the point is, uh, all of these solutions, the horizon has to emerge in the lower energy level. Okay. I was thinking of these examples where it emerges in a very non-trivial way, but if first balls are true, uh, it emerges in a, in a much simpler way. Uh, yeah, the, but yeah, but I, I was just thinking, I was focusing on these, I think, also because these are more well grounded. Uh, first balls, it's much harder to say whether it works or not. Okay. Yeah, but yeah, at least uh, you take the microstates and the horizon is an emergent phenomenon, not a fundamental phenomenon. Yes, yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, uh, he is making, in fact, a pro first Pro first it's not anti first Okay, okay. Yeah. that answer. Right, right. The, pro, the difference of pro first ball and no first ball is whether the emergence is simple or hard. Yeah, so you are saying horizon is like an RG yeah. phenomenon. I mean, that's yeah. like, uh, the yeah. approximation. Yeah. Also, whether the description of the microstates is in the bulk or not. Well, if. Bulk of buffer. Yes, right? It's a bulk description. We know that you can make a bulk description. But Stromingo buffer is a different regime of parameters. Yeah, yeah. So, no, we'll stick to one regime of parameters. Ah. Are there e to the pi s bulk states reliable and the horizon? Yeah. And that is a fast state. Yeah, that's fair. And, and there can't be both, right? Well, I, that's not his position. Oh, I see. You're saying you could have both reliable. Of and the horizon. Like I mean, the horizon would be visible to they would be visible to different experiments. The experiment that see the horizon would not be like this is so that's the argument, right? Like to the extent that there is a horizon, you can't really resolve the first problem. So you don't know what a first ball is. You don't know what a first ball is. Yeah. So first ball is a putative string theory solution. Uh, which does not have a horizon, but at far far away, it kind of looks like a black hole. And the point is that people have written down a huge number of, I think, e to the a over 24 g the last time I checked. So that's like one sixth of the entropy of uh, classical solutions. Uh, but then, like, uh, there are also some issues with, like, okay, they, they have the wrong angular momentum distribution and they have uh, uh, the, you know, you expect that most of the most states that build up the entropy are quantum, not classical. Uh, and stuff like this. So there are this is a big controversial topic, I think. And but first balls are just it's just a fancy way to say there's some string theory solution which looks like a black hole in some region, in some low region. Yeah. I should say that if you have a factor short in the exponent, yeah. that means that the, you know the actual number of such states mm -hmm. is uh, zero, very zero, very small. Yeah, zero. exactly. Of course. Yeah, that's definitely true. yes. Thank you. Okay, yeah. Yeah, the other point to repeat it was that even if you get one six of the entropy, it's still like a uh, number of states to the power one by six, which is tight. Uh, sorry, since I am yeah. the main offender with asking questions, but uh, I just uh, I just uh, two, two, two more slides. Okay. Now let's talk about defective microstates. Ask and promise understandable. Yeah, no, 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 no,
Just names. Yeah, no, no. No, it's uh, like the point is this line and this line is for, more for experts. But I think now I want to say something that's more accessible. Uh, okay. So, what do I mean by effective microtrades? I mean that they are states that don't live in the fundamental Hilbert space. Okay, but they do make up the entropy. Okay, so for example, in terms of the QAC, this is the fundamental Hilbert space. It has exact microstates, but it's more like the CFT Hilbert space, where it's just some CFT. Okay, here you have some incredibly complicated unit trees, but here also you have a Hilbert space. The Hilbert space has the right entropy. Okay, and uh, in some sense, say, uh, it's uh, not uh, this Hilbert space is encoded in this Hilbert space in a very complicated way. What is this sky? Sky looks like total fiction, right? <laughs> No, no, it's just uh, it's a factorization. It's like you so you find uh, you have to given a given the CFT. Ah, so it's chi is part. I'm thinking of chi is part of a neighbor. The part yeah, it's, it's not a, encoding. Yeah, it's, you have to distill it in a very complicated way. Okay, fine. Yeah, but then uh, once you distill it, it like it looks simple enough. So it gives the area basically. Yeah, chi is the thing that carries the area. Uh, there is a slightly better description in terms of algebraic QFT as intertwinal, but I don't want to go there. Okay, uh, cool. And uh, the point is that here we have some Hilbert space where, the, where this guy carries the area entropy, and so the area entropy is easy to find. Here it's very hard to find. But what? Sorry, I'm so sorry. But what was that Hilbert? I mean, it's not the Hilbert space of the bulk. Uh, yeah, I agree. So if you find, if you find this, it's a it's an extremely non trivial job to find this Hilbert space if you know this. You sort of made it up, right? This guy. Yeah, it's like, it's not. Yeah, it's a Oxford Hilbert space. It's not neither this. True semi classical Hilbert space, not the actual. It's not in physics, it's in your head. Uh, no. <laughs> I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I believe that, hey, I believe that auxiliary Hilbert space is fine. Like, okay, fine, yeah. It's fine. yeah. You know, like you say Hilbert space of a particle it doesn't exist. It's uh, something you distilled out of the Hilbert space of the universe. Sure. Yeah. Uh, like the reason I bring it up is not because I, I just want to say, oh, look, <laughs> let's write on the Hilbert space of the right entropy and you get that. The reason I bring it up is that this guy looks more like uh, this. Look, this has a hope because this has a semi classical description, and this has a semi classical description. The hope is that they, there is a semi classical description that kind of looks like this Hilbert space of change. Okay. Uh, and uh, yeah, uh, this semi classical description would have gravity and some sort of a minimal set of new things. Okay. Uh, yeah. So, I wanted to talk about an example where we have a description, but I gave a talk about it in January. So go back, go back in your memories and remember that who, whoever is in the string theory department for the rest of you, I won't go over it. <laughs> Sorry about that. Okay. Uh, and it has to do with the political field theories. Uh, so jumping through it. So let me get to the conclusions. Um, Semi-classical gravity goes far more than it has to be right to. And we see this more clearly in the phenomenon of gravitational entropy. The gravitational entropy, at least some of the time, is some sort of entanglement entropy. Okay. Uh, good. We convert we can convert matter entropy to gravitational entropy, but at the cost of post grade. We can also use matter entropy to rearrange space time. It's the fancy picture I showed but didn't explain. Uh, exact microstates are generally found. I should say this statement more precisely, but uh, it's hard to find uh, horizons and uh, reliable microstates in the same experiment. Let me just say that. Uh, looking for effective microstates in this simple case of topological gravity, uh, the part I skipped so I said it actually casts, uh, it led to a new definition of entanglement in terms of which uh, uh, hopefully we will publish in the next few weeks. Uh, there are open questions that actually have more or less been brought up in the long discussions, and uh, you know, there's a lot to keep me busy, I guess. Okay. Yeah, expect us to already have this. <laughs> Yeah, you're very optimistic. Any questions from the Maybe you can ask the Zoom audience oh, first. Uh, yeah. yes. uh, any questions from the Zoom audience? Yeah, so Vijay here. Um, I want to go back to that error correction uh, analogy, which was made. I mean, there were also questions about if one wants to do error correction. I mean, that part I didn't really understand. What does it even mean to do error correction? Right? I mean, in the quantum context, you do this encoding so that 
there is a mechanism which allows you to detect that an error has taken place, basically perform yeah. measure without the knowing anything about the particular state encoded. Right. Uh, in fact, I'm, I want to know why is this error correction language being used here? And there is okay. no so this is uh, weaker than you are completely right that this is a uh, slightly different and in fact weaker statement than what uh, uh, what is usually meant by quantum error correction. Uh, so maybe one can just call it quantum encoding or something. Basically, in error correction, what one wants to do is you want want to, a smaller Hilbert space in the big Hilbert space, and one wants to also have simple operator that diagnose whether the smaller Hilbert space has been touched or not by your by your noise. Okay. Well, so the, point is the, the first step here is to uh, the so can only do local operations. Typically, that is what is the yeah. Like again, there are different noise models and different error correction models, and uh, I'm trying to be very broad here. So like there is some noise, there is some big Hilbert space and small Hilbert space, which the small Hilbert space carries a message, and then the, based on your measurements of what noise was uh, the no your measurements can tell you. Uh, whether the small Hilbert space were touched by the noise or not, and then you can pick out a particular representative of the small Hilbert space which uh, uh, which is not touched by the noise uh, and get the message out. Right? I think this is very broadly what something that all error correction models I know of fit into. Okay. Sure. Uh, now here we just want the first. Step. We want to think about the fact that uh, we want to encode a, a small Hilbert space into a very large Hilbert space. Okay, in a in, with not uh, with not with such that there are syndrome measurements, but such that this property is true that uh, uh, the small Hilbert space itself, the quotes of space itself, factorizes into stuff reconstructable on on the first factor of the big Hilbert space and the second factor of the big Hilbert space. This capital N, capital N. Okay, so now no one is error correcting. What we are saying is the state has this property that you can lose a lot of details of capital A. Okay, and still have all this bulk information encoded in there in some complicated way. Okay, uh, but in particular, I'm not trying to write down say syndrome operators in this. I'm just trying to say that uh, they, they're it's encoded in a way that uh, uh, has some certain robustness properties. In this paper, he talks about the robustness properties. Okay, and for a second, robustness I, to, I would like to make one more point if you don't mind. Secondly, this story does not say, okay, you take a, uh, take a quotes of space and put it by hand. It says that the state itself, this, which you bought from like, okay, this is, a, this is the ground state of the CFT, for example, has this property built into it. If, if I wanted to take all the bulk matter and encode it into some, uh, encode, do some quantum error correction on it, this would be a good way. The CFT ground state, for example, would be a good, uh, Good state to encode it into. Okay, but and no one is actually doing the encoding. In some sense, the state has a property that it it would be a good encoding if you wanted. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, go ahead. You said something about you know that some states are robust. So then what is robust against what? Here in this context. Uh, robust against what? Uh, it's robust against a bunch of things. For example, you could lose uh, some. Uh, you could lose a lot of UV information uh, about this A, A region. Okay, so for example, good. The basic robustness, uh, oh yeah, basic robustness is that the white, you can lose all of the white region while not losing any of the information in the pink region. That is the basic robustness here. But there is more robustness. You could lose, lose a lot of UV information about, about the A region, and then you can still encode, uh, you can still decode stuff that's deep in the bulk. Okay, uh, and uh, you know people have written down other types of robustness as well, which uh, maybe I don't want to go into. But the basic robustness is that you can just lose all of Aber and still have everything in the, the big region remain. I, I, this question would be, you know, when people say lose something, usually all noises, everything is somewhat local. That's yeah, yeah. So they are local. They're, yeah. Even in space and in time, okay. right at the beginning, kernels and so on. When you say something like A and A bar like that, is there a locally thing in it, or is it that these things are very non locally connected? And no, no, so this, this is a, a, a CFT. Yeah, good. 
no, thanks for that key statement. So the boundary is a CFT statement. Okay, so it could be realized on some cold atom set. Okay. And then what I do is I send half the cold atoms to you. Okay. This is a, a, a particularly nasty example of a noisy channel where uh, I'm, just a, I'm just a person who doesn't like sending all the cold atoms. Okay. Uh, uh, and then uh, what what uh, bulk information is there in that half of half the cold atoms? Okay. More generally, you could have uh, all the all the atoms here are kind of scrambled by by this by this thing. And then you what, what what information you have. There is a locality. So, so if you think of the CFT living on some substrate, one would think of it as a as a local noise. Uh, yeah. So that that would be the answer. Uh, Ronak, maybe you could tell people how different regions of the boundary can encode the same bulk object. Oh yeah, that's also true. That point. I didn't want to get into key sharing bit. Yeah. But I think that sort of reminds you of error correction. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, good. Uh, can Zoom see this? Can I use some other color? Vijay? I'm not seeing any annotations. What What are you doing? No, no. I'm drawing it on the blackboard. You might want to pin the video. Oh, oh wait. Uh, then I have to look at. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I think pink might be better. Okay, let's let's try it. Okay. So, for example, if you have an operator phi of x here, okay, uh, it can be encoded in this a. But it can also be encoded in this B, where B kind of lives here, and A kind of is this region. Okay, and in fact, you can uh, uh, you, you actually this fact that it can be encoded in uh, different boundary regions uh, can be extended to the basic fact that if you take uh, is there a third color. So consider a intersection B. Okay, this guy is not there in the phi of x is not there in a intersection B. Not there in uh, uh, B minus A. Not there in A minus B. Okay, so it's not there in uh, but then. Uh, it is there in A, A and B. It's there in A equals uh, A intersection B union A minus B. Okay. Oh, I got the color scheme picture. Sorry about that. Uh, okay. So this is kind of uh, uh, in QI the structure is known as uh, quantum key secret key distribution. Something key distribution. I forget the forget the actual word, but uh, so this is uh, error correcting that uh, you can actually put it in. You can actually lose various different parts of the boundary. Okay, whatever substrate you have to lose on, but still have your uh, uh, your bulk operator in whatever is remaining. And you know you, it can be in various different parts. But for example, if it can be in A and B, but it can't be in the it need not be in the intersection. Uh, so yeah. So that's, this is an example, but like, you know, there's just a lot more you can say. There's some, there are state merging protocols which you can think of and uh, yeah, so the stories have, the number of properties have increased. There's some exponential gains in complexity you get from this, uh, from this encoding and uh, yeah, sorry, I don't want to go into all of it. So, uh, um, I guess maybe that's probably what you're alluding to now. With this kind of mapping between the quantum information language of error correction and uh, what you're trying to do what is the benefit in terms of what you are trying to do does it are you able to borrow some other ideas or other theorems or other results which then directly have some meaning in your case or is it just a you know happy coincidence which is fun to look at there definitely are various benefits on us uh, that have been found from this you know like uh, in particular, this entanglement by reconstruction, this proof that uh, everything in the pink regions in A was something that really came out of quantum error correction, the quantum error correction, like error correction language. But even now, like uh, you can uh, think about 
So you can think about bulk states which are uh, in a regression language language incompressible. Okay, so then there is uh, there are one shot to assess uh, asymptotic quantities you can think about, and uh, uh, th there is this recent story about uh, uh, the black hole information paradox, which uh, is basically related, to, uh, and it has some funny properties. So first of all, that information paradox came from this uh, uh, story of what are called alpha bits, which was developed by Hader and Pennington, and uh, uh, which is a statement about approximate error correction. So it really came out of that. But even afterwards, like, uh, you know, it has some funny properties which can be understood in terms of definitive theorems. Uh, sorry, at some, at some point I'm just dropping a lot of jargon, but, <laughs> you know, in the point is that there, the exchange has been fruitful both ways. Uh, yeah. And okay. uh, the, from, from, the, from the ADSCFT side to the QI side, there has been some uh, discussion recently about uh, what are called relativistic quantum tasks. Uh, and turns out ADS CFT as a code does significantly better than any known algorithm uh, for this, for some for some particular quantum tasks. And then uh, yeah, uh, so people are talking about entanglement complexity trade-offs about of these quantum tasks these days. Yes, yeah, sorry, it's just there's a lot of stuff. It's not uh, it's not an inert thing. I think it's something that is interesting and is producing results. Actually, find yes. They're saying, then we go back to Vijay in a minute. You know, is there a quantum error correcting code which holography suggests that has actually been useful for some kind of error correction? That Vijay or the quantum information theory community. Yeah, so the, this is the point that uh, uh, so there are some relativistic quantum tasks uh, which, if you if you are willing to give me 10 minutes, maybe I can even explain the task to you. Uh, these relativistic quantum tasks are. Uh, quantum tasks of the form, okay, given some inputs to do, do this unit. Okay, except that uh, different different sectors of the Hilbert space are in different positions. Okay, so that it takes finite time for them to send stuff to us. Okay, and it turns out that uh, the best known uh, uh, the best known algorithm has exponential complexity in the number amount of the complexity of the actual thing you need to do is found is exponential in what you in the task. In the complexity of the task. Holography is linear. Okay, so people in the QI community have been trying to actually write down holographic words, which can uh, which can, which can get this linear uh, scaling, linear or polynomial. I might be getting the thing wrong, but uh, and the point is just that there is a the reason it's linear is that the entanglement is huge. The entanglement is uh, exponential. Okay. So, uh, very very recently, Patrick Hayden wrote a paper where the uh, entanglement have, was bounded below by a linear function and above by a doubly exponential function, for example. So, but they are trying to write down such codes. And uh, actually, all these things very very long No, it's a fact that you have the the long rangeness is not so important. It's the fact that there is some. It's the fact that this new classical description emerges as what's important. Right. Yes. Tensor network good enough for this? No, tensor networks don't have this problem. No, more tensor networks don't have this problem. So they're trying to write down better tensor networks. But also holographic tensor networks have some good distance properties that uh, people have been studying uh, for, for as surface codes in their own right. Uh, yeah, so, you know, there's some, this is, yeah, this stuff both ways. It's not, yeah. Okay, so maybe one quick question before we end. It's yeah. about language. So when you say exact, I'm going to say what you mean when you say exact associate exit. What can you do? Like, does it mean that you are able to identify a set of micro uh, states of particular type? Does it mean you are able to count them and show that there are less than there are those on the What is what do you mean when you say exact associate exits? Good. What I mean is that there is a Hilbert space and uh, Bunch of states which are exact energy against states of the of a Hamiltonian, okay, or okay, uh, which uh, and the number of these exact energy against states in some uh, range of energies, which you which is equal to some black the black hole mass, uh, is a is the exponent of the entropy, number of orthogonal states, the dimension of this subspace. Uh, this is the existence state. Now you can ask, okay, how do you find them? So there is a trivial one. 
what I told you is just a trivial description of the actual surface. But in general, for example, one might want a more explicit description of the surface. So, for example, Strominger Rafa wrote down a free, uh, wrote down a, something that looks like a free boson CFK and said, okay, every state with this many ladder operators, uh, creation operators. Or uh, recently, uh, I wrote a paper where we took a simple black hole and found an explicit wave function, which has, which is a black hole microstate. Uh, so, stuff like this. Uh, there's existence, which is just uh, uh, consequence of duality. And then there is finding them. And both are important questions. Uh, but yeah. When you say existence will be formal, you have been able to it can be formal. But it, what's important is that there is a Hilbert space and there are exactly orthogonal states in that Hilbert space. And when you say exact uh, uh, in a sense right. represent those not exist. I mean that the Hilbert space does not contain uh, the Hilbert the Hilbert space does not contain these exactly orthogonal states. They only contain a bunch of approximately orthogonal states, uh, which uh, uh, you know, or rather the description uh, you have enough approximately orthogonal states you can actually create an exact uh, orthogonal pair of states, but the description of that would be like uh, would be completely different, right? It won't be the same. Uh, there will be some very quantum superposition of something. Uh, yeah, this is what I mean. Okay, maybe you do. Let's start on it again.